Hey, welcome back to the Dads Making a Difference podcast. Are you a dad struggling to stay fit and active as you age? I know this is something I think about often as a 43-year-old father of two. Well, in this episode, I'm sitting down with Alan Misner. He's a fitness expert who's dedicated to helping people over 40 transform their health. Alan's going to share his personal journey from being an overweight, unhappy corporate professional to becoming a fit, adventurous father capable of tackling the most challenging obstacle races with his daughter. You're going to learn how our relationships with our kids can spark a life-changing fitness transformation. You're also going to explore how training needs evolve as we age and how we can adapt those fitness routines accordingly so we can get the best results. And Alan's going to share with you the key factors beyond exercise that will contribute to a successful health transformation. So whether you're aiming to elevate your current routine or seeking new inspiration, Alan's experience will equip you with tools to become a healthier, more active dad. This episode of the Dads Making Difference podcast with Alan Misner starts right now. Alan, welcome to the Dads Making a Difference podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well, Cam. It's good to be here. Thank you. Man, I'm excited for a conversation. Anytime I can have a conversation with another guy who is passionate about fitness, especially for our guy, us guys over 40, uh, I'm excited to dive in. So, Alan, why don't you give our listeners and the men who are listening to this a little bit about you and why you're passionate for the work that you do? Well, I never set out to be a personal trainer. It was, you know, not even in the recesses of belief that I would ever do this. Um, I was a corporate guy. So I went in for accounting and, you know, got my certified uh, public accountant, which is what you get in the United States. I think it's called charter accountant in most other parts of the world. Um, I got that and I went into work and I was working and I worked my way up. Uh, I had a daughter pretty quickly out of college and, you know, she was wonderful uh, unfortunately, my mother and I kind of broke up. So we, um, I still kept in touch. So work was with her all the time. She's still my baby. Uh, but um, as I got into my career, I started focusing only on my career mm. and not on really much else. And so I found myself at 39 years old, uh, really out of shape, really overweight, really unhealthy, in miserable relationships and just completely miserable, unhappy. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, the words I use for myself, uh, I, I don't even want to, sometimes I don't even want to repeat those words anymore, but, uh, yeah, all of that. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this. And for eight years I tried yeah, and I failed hmm. and I'd lose some weight and I'd gain it back. And then I'd get excited to start something and I'd hurt myself. And so it was just this cycle after cycle after cycle. And so now I find myself in my mid mid forties. And I'm, I'm no better off, like no better off. It may be worse mm. and I'm older. So it is worse. You know, it's like, okay, what do I got to do here? I don't understand. And there weren't, there weren't really resources. There was no one out there saying, you know, you have to train different when you're over 40. I learned that one the hard way. Uh, there was no one out there. There were no podcasts. There, were, there was no books. All the books were on stretching. So I was thinking, okay, you yeah. turn 40 and then you're just supposed to stretch till you die. Um, <laughs> It looked like there was nothing there. And yeah. so I said, okay, this, this can't be that hard. Uh, I was traveling about 90%. So when I say I pour myself into my job, my job was about 90% travel, which if you do the math, okay, that leaves me with a weekend home a month. Wow. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So there was no real way for me to hire a personal trainer or all these other things that I would encourage people to look into today. But and there was no one online. I, I was like, I was kind of shocked because there were coaches, but there were bodybuilding coaches or powerlifting coaches really, really, really niche down into, if you want to be ready and, and learn how to pose, I can coach you online how to pose. Or if you want to learn how to do a certain lift, right. I can coach you how to do a power lift, right. There were, but there was no one saying, okay, generally I want to work with people over 40 and help you. There were no, there's no information. So I, I became a personal trainer for myself. I, I, I went and took the NSM uh, course and I passed that test. I got the corrective exercise. I'm like, okay, what do I need? Uh, fitness, nutrition. And then I got into uh, corrective, I mean, to uh, functional aging with the Functional Aging Institute. 
and I started training myself, but none of that would have happened the way it did if this one thing had not happened. And it was a phone conversation I was having with my daughter. And so I had done a little bit of work, but this was, this was probably about the time that I would have fallen back again. You know, I I, I gained a little bit of ground, but this was like, it was felt, it felt the same, you know, okay. I'm I'm peaking again, not even nowhere near where I need to be. And I'm probably going to go back down into the trenches again. And my daughter said this to me, she she was doing CrossFit and she had just gotten her level one and she started doing these obstacle course races and things like that. So she was exactly what I was when I was her age. And she said to me, daddy, I want you to come watch me do this CrossFit competition. Hmm. And for me, that was a kick in the gut. You didn't I think for watch. most dads, it would be because yeah. I know you're going to watch your, your daughter play basketball later today, but that's what you do because you're not going to be out there slam dunking on the kids. Um, but I didn't <laughs> yeah. see myself as a spectator, you know, especially in something like this, something I could do, something I could participate. I wanted to be a participant. So if she was doing hard things, I wanted to be doing hard things. Uh, but I, I wasn't in a position to do that. I wasn't physically capable of doing that. And I knew that that was really a big problem, a big problem for the relationship I wanted to have with my daughter. And then down the line, all the other relationships that I want to have. Um, and so I did the scary audacious thing and I invited my daughter for us to go do a tough mutter. Now, if you don't know what a tough mutter is, it's a 12 to 13 mile uh, run yeah. on very hard terrain. So it's basically back where they do the ATVs and the trucks do the mudding and all, you know, motorbikes yeah. and motocross and all that. That's where these things are held. So this is not just your standard half marathon type thing. The run itself would be hard. Uh, but the nice people at the, at this place, what they like to do is they throw in about 25 obstacles <laughs> yeah. just, just to make it spicy. Uh, at the time, this was a pretty big deal because I think this was the toughest uh, obstacle course thing for civilians that's out there. And actually the only one that had had a death while doing it. <laughs> so, you know, this is not just a lighthearted, oh, we're going to go do this little fun run. Yeah. And the other side of it was I didn't want it to be something where my daughter would want to run off and leave me or would stay with me and not finish or just feel scared for me the whole time is yeah. I wanted to run her race with her, you know, so I wanted this to be as fun and challenging for her as it was going to be for me. But when I say fun and challenge, I wanted it to be fun for me. I didn't want to kill myself to do this thing. So it lit a fire under me, as you might imagine, yeah. because I had to do something. I had to do a lot of some things. And so having now my, my certifications and doing through all that, I figured out what I needed to do, how I needed to train, what I needed for my body. And I trained. Yeah. How old were you? I was 47. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so as I went into this, I, you know, I, I, I did it. I literally took my body and transformed it in that eight months. I lost 66 pounds of fat. Wow. Put on 11 pounds of muscle. So I went to see a nutritionist and she told me about paleo. So I did some research and I did a little bit, cleaned up my eating a whole lot, Mm -hmm. uh, as you might imagine, and was able to get myself in the condition to be able to do that. And, um, that, that, that was huge. So at the end of the Tough Mudder, one of the things they like to do is they, they hang these electrodes and yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're all wet and muddy, and now you start running through little wires that are electrified. Um, and they will, quite frankly, knock you on your butt when they hit you. They're, they're, this, is not a, this is not a joke. These are real yeah. electricity, real water, real mud, real pop. You hit the ground. So we come around the corner. We're coming up to this obstacle. This is the next to the last obstacle. There's about 30 men, young men standing there looking at this obstacle with trepidation and fear. They had just watched their buddies just get knocked to the face. This is down. One guy got knocked down on his face. And when he tried to get up, he got hit again and he was down again. So these guys were all just like terrified. And my, my daughter's like, what do you want to do? Are we going to wait for them? I'm like, no, run around them. So she runs around. I run around and we come back and I clasp her hand and we run all the way through. Mm-hmm. Now, 
I also majored in physics when I was younger. So there's a little bit of a thing called displacement of electricity, a bigger, larger mass. The electricity is not as bad. So holding my daughter's hand, I, I did give us a competitive advantage over running through as a single male. That aside, <laughs> it was a pretty exciting moment. And then we finished the race. We, we crossed the finish line holding hands. Amazing. Now, if you're a dad, <laughs> you're listening to this. Then, then you know, okay, there's, there's special moments in your life. Mm -hmm. And so the special, I have three really, really special moments in my daughter's life. And the first one was when she was born. Okay. So she was laying on the table. They were checking her out because uh, she was born OP. And uh, when I reached out, she grabbed my pinky, her fingers wrapped around my pinky. Okay. The next one was. Uh, just about a year and a half ago, I walked her across the aisle Yeah, when she got married. I know if I didn't do what I had done before to change my life, I probably wouldn't have been around 10 years later to do that. Yeah. Okay. And then the final one was, yes, holding her hand, crossing that finish line at a tough mutter, participating in her life rather than spectating. Amazing. And so, you know, I, I call the term, I call it fit for task. And it's kind of this principle that you're not exercising. These are not workouts. You say, I hate to work out. I don't like going to the gym. I don't like doing these things. I don't either. Yeah. Who does? I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I do, I do, but I but do because I easy. look at it. Not right, because not, it's easy and right. not because I, I want to spend the time doing that. There's a thousand other things I could do or enjoy doing more. But here's what I do know. I want to be fit for the task that's necessary for me. Yeah. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great grandfather, which uh, I just got notified might be happening Amazing. soon. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> so when I start thinking about that, what does that mean? Well, that means I'm there to do the things I am supposed to do. Yep. carry heavy things. Cause that's what men are supposed, we're supposed to carry the heavy stuff guys. Um, I carry heavy things. And, um, if my wife were to fall on herself, mm -hmm. I'm going to pick her up and put her in a car and drive her to the hospital. Yep. We don't really have a good ambulance system here where I live, but I got to put her in a car and drive her to the hospital. If, uh, my grandchildren, when they're born, their grandfather is not going to be sitting in a rocking chair, watching them play on the floor. I'm going to be playing on the floor with them. I'm not going to be the grandfather sitting on a bench at the entrance of the zoo, waiting for them to finish and ask them how it went. I'm going to be out there running with them from the zebras to the lions, enjoying that day as much as I possibly can. And so when you start looking at it that way, this is all training. Mm -hmm. When I lift weights, that's training. When I'm working on stamina, that's training. When I'm doing as hard as hell hit training class, running and sprinting and doing my thing, that's training. It's training to be the individual. Now, when I was a kid, we, you know, younger guy, we didn't have tough mutters. And I was in the infantry, so I did a lot of that stuff. But that's neither here nor there. We didn't have that stuff, though, when I was growing up. You know, you had some 5Ks, 12 maybe you had marathons. They were doing some marathons, but it just wasn't the wasn't big. Um, now they're doing tough mutters and, and all kinds of uh, CrossFit type, you know, functional fitness stuff really crazy. I don't know what they're going to be doing in 20 years. Right. But I'm going to be the it. crazy old man doing it with my grandkids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. You know? And, yeah. and so that's, that's kind of the point. If they're all sitting around in the game room playing video games, grandpa is going to be in there playing with them. Mm. I might suck at the game, but I'm going to be able to sit in there and play. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that's the way I just, when I, when I put that in that context in my head, it makes it all so much easier because there's no reason for me to not do it and all right. the reason to. Right. I love it. I love you're speaking my language, man. Like, <laughs> you know, I talked to men and I shared with you a little bit on our pre-call uh, a couple of weeks ago um, about starting fight the dad bod back in 2015 and, and that what morphed into a fitness and nutrition coaching program for dads started 
with my desire to be able to do a hike up a mountain to the lake up at the bowl at the top with my four-year-old on my back and a two-year-old on the front. And like, that was the goal. It, so when they got tired, I could carry them. And so when my yeah. wife got tired, I could push them. And when, you know, these types of things. And through that, people were saying like, how are you able to do this? How are you able to like do this? Well, it's because I train. And I love that you said yeah. that because this doesn't come naturally to people. Like you see a guy like yourself, Alan, who's in shape, he's doing adventures, you're doing your things with your daughter, you're off to Europe here, and you're probably walking around, putting in lots of time each day to do activities. But that doesn't just come because innately, genetically, you're born with it. It's because you've been intentional doing the stuff behind the scenes that matters. And I love it. Yeah. I love it, man. I can tell you, you can look at the before picture of me before I did all this and you can say, yeah. no, he was, he's not genetically gifted at all. Um, <laughs> so no, it took, it took training. It took <laughs> effort. It took attention to what I was putting in my body, how I was treating my body. And, and yeah, it was all in, it was all intentional. Yeah. And you're right. There is a barrier. And I'm going to, some people are like, oh, turning 30 is the tough. 30 was easy, man. 30 <laughs> was easy. And then for me, it was 35 where I started to feel like, oh, wait a second. I play men's league basketball. I'm not recovering as fast. Or I do a really hard workout. I can't do a really hard workout tomorrow. Like my body started to tell me that. I still felt great. Now I'm 43 and I'm like, I'm training differently. So you mentioned this, you mentioned how you need to train differently depending on where yeah. you're at and no, we are not stretching until we die, which is the yeah. messaging to guys 40 plus it's stay limber, stay mobile. It's mobility. Well, I don't want mobility. I want strength and stamina and those things you talked about, but you okay. need all of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. True. Uh, wh how does it differ for a guy who's 30 now he's, in his 40s, 50s, 60s, how does it differ? Okay. Well, one, one of the core things is, yes, you're right. It's, it, it's about recovery. It's about how our body responds to stress um, and things like that. For a lot of us, we're not doing the same things we did when we were in our 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. We're much more sedentary during the day. We're much more focused on our career and our job and our families and everything else. And so, we, we you know, the, the hours aren't even there. So yeah. we've got to come up with it with a smarter way. So there's, there's, there's two aspects to this one. We talk about fit for task and what that is, then what, what do I need? So, you know, I think a lot of times we get locked into the, oh, well, I just want to get hunk and strong. And I, I do too. I mean, I want that every day, but do I need to be able to do that thing? So I, I tore my rotator cuff when I was 51 and the, you know, I, I went to a coach, I hired a coach. Yes. Coaches need coaches. Um, I went to the coach and I said, okay, I want to do some strength training. I'm, I'm getting ready to do a Spartan. I want to do some strength training. So I, I was, I was signed up to do the Spartan with my brother and then his daughter ended up with a dance recital on the same weekend. So I'm, I'm, I'm going solo on this thing. And so I, I was still training. I told him I want to get really, really strong so I could do well in this tough mudder. Cause my, my brother's about, I don't know, 10, 15 years younger than me. So, um, to compete and be there and he's a firefighter. So to compete with him, yeah, I'm going to have to push myself a little bit. So I'm doing another push and I was getting really strong. My, my squat was back where it was when I was offensive lineman in high school, my deadlift was higher than it was when I was an offensive lineman in high school. And here I was working on chest and shoulders and I was, I was starting to get to the point where I was as almost as strong there too. And so one day I sit down and kind of just do this silly thing when I'm trying to do military press with dumbbells, seated military press was seated overhead press with dumbbells. And as soon as I did it, I knew it was dumb and pop, there went my mm. rotator cuff, like poor tour. And so what did that mean? Well, did it mean I stopped training? Did it mean I stopped doing everything? No, it means that because I still had the tough mutter, I still wanted to get really strong. <laughs> I didn't change, but I just knew I couldn't push anything. Mm. Uh, so I just, we just modified my training. I said, we're going to modify my training. I'm not doing any pushing movements with my chest, shoulders. We tried a few different things and none of it worked. There was no strength there because um, it was a complete tear. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is probably good because if it wasn't a complete tear, I probably would have tore it. You would have pushed through. Um, I would have pushed through, like, you know, train, no pain, no, you know, because again, where, this, where our brain is, it's ego. 
ego beats us more often than anything else. Yeah. And so we did the training and I was able to do the Spartan. Now, one of the sad parts is you have to jump into this corral and it's about a four foot wall. And again, pushing was a problem, but that's what they asked me to do before I even started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my wife saw me and she's like, what are you doing? You're hurt. And I'm like, I'm going to finish it. Don't worry. And then she said, like, this is probably the last one of these I'm going to have to do. We run around the corner. I run around the corner. There's three more of them. <laughs> so it wasn't the last one. And if you can't do an obstacle in the Spartan, you're obligated to do 10 burpees. Mm, which also not can't cool. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. Also not cool. Um, anyway, I got through the race. Uh, and then I went to a, get the work done. I got it fixed, worked my way up. But then that's when it occurred to me. I was like, okay, if I'm training fit for task, my task is not to compete at Spartans. My task is to take care of myself and my family. Yeah. And so what's the heaviest thing I'd ever have to put over my head? Well, certainly not 85 pound dumbbells. Yeah. Okay. Which was what I was lifting the day I tore my rotator cuff. And I'm like, so maybe a box that weighs 30, 40 pounds, maybe a suitcase I'm putting in an overhead bin next week, yeah. you know, heaviest things I got to put over my head. And so, yes, I, I could have, I could get back to 100% from the perspective of the, the lift, but why? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the real purpose? And so when you do get to the real purpose and you can set real goals that are based on life real life lesson, life stuff, not trying to just be this or that and feel good, not ego checks, nothing like that, but just from a perspective of growth. And then from there, I just work with what I call gentle nudges. So when you figure out where you are today, be there, be, be satisfied with where you are. You're, you're going to start moving forward, but if you do it with just gentle nudges, so a little bit more mm -hmm. and then recover, give your body what it needs. And then if you want a little bit more, and then you're going to hit a strength place where you're like, okay, I'm strong enough here. And that's why, again, I say it's all of it. So if you need to recover, you can still do mobility work on recovery days. You can still do stamina work on the days you're not lifting. Yeah. And so there's, there's lots of opportunities for you to basically get yourself a very balanced fitness for the things you do in your life. Cause I don't know, I'm probably still going to have to tie shoes when I'm 70 yeah. and I'm still going to want to, you know, do other things when I get older. So it doesn't make any sense to hurt myself, but on the other side, it also doesn't make any sense to not do something to improve myself every day. Yeah. And by the sounds of it, what you shared, you might have something else to hold above your head. You might have a little one at one point, a little one. And, and yes, and yes, I might have to do that. And I'll, I will, and I will do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing, but you know, I, I hate to tell this story, but I love to tell this story because this will, this will kind of put it into context. Yeah. Okay. There are things in your life that you love. You love doing something. So people will tell you, well, you, you got to give up tennis and start playing pickleball. And so everybody does that. The older people just move over to pickleball. Okay. And then there'll be a point where someone will tell you you're too old to play pickleball. Yeah. Okay. And then you'll stop playing pickleball. So my grandfather loved, loved, loved golf. And for a lot of people going into retirement, okay, golf is a great sport, right? You can play it for a long, long time. Well, he got to about the age of 80 and he had to stop playing because his balance was going on. He couldn't swing the club and control his body. And so he lost his, he lost his balance. He, he lost his golf. Now for a lot of people, they'd be like, okay, well that's, that, he's 80, right? So yeah. he's going to kick any day now. He lived for 15 more years. So the last 15 years of his life, or basically one sixth of it, he could not play golf. Mm -hmm. Which he loved. Which he loved. And so he lost the sport he loved. Now, flash forward 10 years, he's 90 years old. He's living in an assisted care apartment by himself. He cannot make it from the chair to the bathroom in time. So he has to call someone up and they have to come clean him up because he can't even clean himself up. And he lived like that for five years. And I didn't see him the last five years because he just didn't want to be around people and have that happen. Okay. So 
I want to be the guy who can wipe his own ass when I'm 105. You know, I, I want to be independent. I want to be secure. And if I do something stupid that breaks me, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I want to approach this with the responsibility of the life cycle that I'm going through. There is an aging curve. I'm going to fight that tooth and nail all the way through, but I'm definitely not going to help it age me faster by injuring myself and have to spend a lot of time not training. If I were to hurt myself, I'd be working on mobility and balance and, and stamina if I could, but I'm going to work whatever I got it, whatever, whatever's going on in my life, I'm going to train. And when I tore my rotator cuff and I went into physical therapy, the surgery, the surgery is on Thursday and I went into physical therapy on Monday. Okay. Physical therapist is like, what are you doing here? I'm like, can I start today? And he's like, sure. <laughs> Yeah. Most people wait a little while, but okay. And then he did the measurements, my range of motion. And he said, he said, your, your range of motion for someone who just went th through that surgery, he says, off the charts, what have you been doing? And I said, training. I said, I never stopped training just because I couldn't push a bar. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean I couldn't pull it. And so my arm was moving through the full range of motion while I was doing overhead rows, while I was doing deadlifts while I was doing dumbbell rows, I was still doing all the things that I could do during that period of time. And as a result, my recovery went a thousand times faster. In fact, I finished up the basic range of motion work within three weeks that was supposed to take six. And then he was like, I have to actually call the doctor because I'm not sure I can put you into strength training yet. Mm. Cause I've never had someone come through this fast. Yeah. And this guy used to work with division one athletes. So, you know, I'm an athlete from the perspective of being a great father and a great husband. And that's how I approach my life. I'm training for something and I'm not going to let injury put me down. Yeah. Well, it's a difference between training and working out. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's a, di I'm going to go work out. Are you, or are you going to train? Yeah. Like, where are you at? No, I appreciate yeah. that perspective. And I think for many, for many <laughs> of us, yeah, for many of us, uh, we do get to a point where it's not about, there was a period in my twenties where it's about looking good in the mirror. That's not yeah. what it, yeah, I do want to look good. I do, I want to look Everybody wants to look good and feel good. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to be functional and I want to be able to do yeah. things, right? Um, what did you learn out? You lost 66 pounds. Like that's a lot of weight. And then gained yeah. 11 pounds of muscle. What did you learn during that time that was different from what you had tried in the past where it was kind of that yo-yo work, didn't work, work, didn't work? It's, it's not rocket science, but it is. I guess it's the best way I can say this is that your body, your, if you can imagine your body, there's like this internal brain, okay? okay. And what you tell that brain tells the world, tells it what's going on in the world. So imagine the world, it doesn't have eyes, so it doesn't know. It just knows what you tell it. So if you're eating crap food and it's not getting the nutrition, it's like, oh, there's a problem. So it tells you more and you're thinking more Twinkies. It's, when it says more, it means more nutrition, actually more nutritious foods. So if you're feeding your body, so if you think I'm basically food is information, I'm feeding my body good quality food, getting enough protein, getting a good mix of foods, my body can relax and say, oh, there's, there's plenty. Mm. I don't have to worry about it. But if you're telling it, all we got is these Twinkies, dude, then your body's going to say, I can't get rid of fat. I might need that because yeah. it's scarce food out there. It's low nutrition food. So you can be overfed and undernourished. Yeah, absolutely. Getting more calories than you need. Okay. The same thing works with physically. If you're just sitting at your office and, and you're very sedentary, then your body's thinking, okay, well, dude, what are you doing? Why aren't we not going outside? Why are we not moving around? Why are you not picking up heavy stuff? That's what we were designed to do. We were designed to move around and carry big, heavy stuff. Cause we go kill something and we carry it back to the cave. We'd walk for hours to find that thing to kill. We'd root for vegetables. We'd climb trees for other things. 
we moved. We moved all day long, looking for food, finding food, getting what we needed. And then, yes, we would come and rest. If we're not doing that movement on a regular basis, our body's like, oh, is there a predator? Is there something bad going on? I'm not going to get rid of this fat because I might need it. Yeah. So that's my cortisol kicks in. That's my only. So the communication channels for how that happens is your endocrine system. So every endocrine system thing that happens, it just, it, there's an internal control that's saying, do I have the food I need? Do I have the movement? Are we sleeping well? Are we managing our stress? How do we feel? Mm-hmm. And then the final one is that, that guy. Okay. So I am going to share my word. When I was sitting on the beach and wanting to change that whole eight years, I called myself the fat bastard because mm. I didn't like myself. I didn't like how I was. And I was just very internally mean to myself. So when I failed, that guy came out. Yeah. So you're such a freaking failure. Da, 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 lots of even worse. I mean, I can't even yeah. say it on air. Um, that was that guy. And we all have that a narrative thing going. I'm like, well, recently someone said there's people that don't. I don't, I don't, I've never met one, but we mm-hmm. all have that that voice in our head, the judging voice. And if you really thought about it, it's like, okay, if your friend tells you, man, I'm trying to lose some weight, and then you go over there and you see him eating a donut, you're not gonna say, You bat bastard, do you say you're on a diet? What are you doing eating a donut? You know, you would never say that, right? Right. To your friend. But we will say that to ourselves in a minute. Yeah. So you've got to start being kind to yourself. You've got to start treating yourself like you're your best friend. Like you want the best for yourself. And when all of that's kind of starting to work out, you're being kind to yourself. You're moving more. You're eating well. You're sleeping better. Your stress is lower. Your body will tell you, okay, I get it. I don't need this weight. I can just let it go. We're getting everything we need. So here you go. You don't need this. You're moving too much. In fact, carrying all this fat around is is hard. Let's, let's stop doing that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You need to lift heavier things. I'm going to adapt to make you stronger. Yeah. I'm going to make you faster. I'm going to build your stamina. I'm going to make you better at what you're trying to do here. I don't know why you're trying to do it, but you need to do it, obviously. So I'm going to help you do it. So your body adapts. You get stronger, better, faster. You lose the weight. And so my body, what I was communicating to my body was that I needed to lose that weight. I needed to get stronger. I needed more muscle mass to do whatever I was training to do. And my body responds. If you're missing two or more of those elements, it's probably not going to happen. So if you're exercising or doing your workouts or doing your training, but you're not managing what you eat, it's not going to work. We could get away with that when we were younger, but it's not going to work now. If you're not getting good sleep, not going to work. So be thinking about each of those areas and saying, if I can do a little better in each of those areas, my body's going to respond positively. And it will, it, it absolutely will. I love it, man. I love it. This is consistent. Well, if, if there's anything that I've shared over the last two years on this podcast, when health even surfaces to a conversation, it's what you just shared. And so I love it. I love what you're doing. Uh, I appreciate you being here to share uh, with us your work and your passion I have a question for you. I asked most guys this, you know, you shared your heading out on an adventure here with your wife for your 10 year anniversary. So happy anniversary. Uh, Thank you. But recently, Alan, what is one thing or one area that you're excited about diving into an area of growth you're committed to right now? Well, you know, as I got to thinking about one word I hear all the time, it, it was about how people are lacking motivation. Mm. You know, I'm just not motivated. I'll start on Monday. I'll start on the first. I'll start, you know. And so there's this, this thing, a belief that motivation is some sort of magical force. that's just going to show up. You just wait for it, right? It's coming. I know it's going to stay because I need it. And then it's not there. Okay. What I came to understand is motivation is not some special force. Motivation comes from doing. Mm, I love that. So you have to do something first. And so I've been working on a model 
that basically realizes there's two types, two places that you get motivation. You get it from accountability mm -hmm. and you get it from self-efficacy. Accountability is easier. You hire a coach, you join a group. So you've got a leader level and a social level. It's there. So when you're getting started, that's the best place to start because it's the easiest, but it's not the most long-term. When you start doing the things on the self-efficacy side, this thing blows up. So on the self-efficacy, we have a leader and that's you being the CEO of your own health. Mm. You're putting the strategies and tactics in place that you need to make sure you're successful. You're eliminating your excuses. You're packing your gym bag the night before versus trying to do it first thing in the morning and missing some things. You're going to bed half an hour early so you can get up half an hour early and get your workout in. That's, that's self-management. That's self-efficacy. But the most important one is that social aspect of it. And this is when you start to relate to being the person you're supposed to be. The easiest one I can come up with is a runner. So someone's walking, they start jogging, they join up, they sign up for a 5k, they start loving it. They sign up for another one and they start buying the shoes and the bottles and all the stuff. And they're like, I'm a runner. And what do runners do? Runners run. So it's not weird for them to set their alarm half an hour earlier because yeah. they've got a longer run today, but that's what they do. They get up, they do the run. They don't think about what they're going to do that morning. In fact, if a runner can't run, if they injure themselves and have to take time off, they go crazy. I'm supposed to be running. Okay. Yeah. That's self-efficacy with values and habits. Your self-identity is the person you're supposed to be. So taking it all the way from the front of understanding fit for task and the reason you're doing all this and then saying, my motivation is already there. I just have to be the person I'm supposed to be and I'll do the things I'm supposed to do. That's harder because that's inside your head. So you can start with the coach, start with the groups, work your way over to self-management and then of course identity. And when you do that, now you may have feet in many, many of those, all those quadrants, but that's what you need to do. And so as a coach, someone who's trying to get fit myself, I have a lot of those things with the self-efficacy. I, I can manage self-managed. I can identify. I still hire coaches because yeah. it's just an added little dose of motivation to push myself a little bit more. So as you go through this process of thinking of who you want to be, you got to start being. And that, that's, to me, that's the key that's always been missing is like, I just don't feel motivated. And, and I was like, well, okay, what's different for me now than it was before. And the difference is that identity. The difference is the self-management. The difference is I hired coaches when I needed them. The difference is I, I joined groups like you, I met yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to, you're going to make me want to work harder. And so as you start doing these things, because we're listening to this podcast, you're already in the model. You just have to add more, add more, do more and get yeah. more. It's what this is all about. I love it. Thanks, Alan. Alan, if there's guys listening to this right now and they want to connect with you, learn more about you, where can they do that? Yeah, go. You can go to 40plusfitness.com forward slash DMD. So dad's making difference. Dad's yeah. make, cool. Making a difference. Okay. DMD. So that's 40 P L U S F I T N E S S forward slash DMD. Excellent. Alan, I appreciate you. I appreciate your message and the work that you're doing. Thanks for taking time away to be here. And I wish you all the best as you go forward and have a fantastic trip. Thank you, Cam. And I hope your daughter has an awesome game. Right.